Well, and thank you, Richard. What an excellent job you did steering uh, that remarkable panel uh, to its various conclusions. This is what I love about the FOSI conference and the fact that you know we can start with raw data, uh, we can move into that kind of a conversation on, on mental health and well-being, uh, and now we're going to segue again into, uh, shall we say, a more technology-focused conversation. Um, and joining me, uh, as you can see now on screen, is Karen Ressmeyer. Karen is Director of Family Trust for Amazon Kids, and she oversees the team that creates digital and hardware products for kids and families. And you know, Karen, I'm just gonna hand it over to you. Thank you, Stephen. And uh, hello, FOSI. It's great to be here again. Um, and as Stephen said, I'm the director of Family Trust for Amazon Kids. And what my team does is we're responsible for working internally with our product teams to help develop and launch you know, these new and really innovative products for kids and families. Um, but to show you, we put together a short video, and this will showcase some of the things that my team does to help earn the trust of families and kids. Kids are funny, unpredictable, and even when they seem like tech experts, they still need their parents' guidance. That's why Amazon offers an entire collection of kids' products and services, like Amazon Kids Plus on Fire TV, Kindle, Tablet, Amazon Glow, and Echo, built just for kids, all connected by the Amazon Parent Dashboard. We're building products and creating tools and content that grow with your family's needs. And with Amazon Kids, you control the settings, set limits and boundaries on services, select age-appropriate content, and more. This is Trust by Design. We understand that your family's privacy and safety are as important as ever. And as your family's tech and device needs evolve, we'll continue to offer fun new experiences for kids with parental controls and safety built in. Whether they're video chatting, playing games on their phone, or reading along with Alexa, you can have peace of mind. Alexa, let's read. Schoolwork always came first, but whenever he could, Michael played, dreamed, and lived basketball. And as they grow up, we'll grow with them. Well, as we've all experienced, the last 18 months have been so challenging for families and especially for our kids. And last year, at last year's conference, when we met a year ago, we discussed the impact of the pandemic on families and kids and the ways that parents, educators, and other grownups can help support kids by cultivating resilience. And we've talked about that this morning as well. But here we are back again, and this year we're focused on recovery and renewal and creating that new normal. Um, earlier, I had a chance to have a conversation with Stephen Balkup and Dr. Michael Rich, who is the founder of the Digital Wellness Lab at Boston Children's Hospital. We were able to reflect on some of these issues and also talk about the positive role technology can play in child development. So I want to share with you some highlights from that conversation. Karen and Dr. Rich, I'm so glad that we could get together today to do this. Um, Karen, you've had a chance to introduce yourself earlier to the conference attendees. Dr. Rich, could you please tell the audience a little more about yourself and the work you're doing at the Digital Wellness Lab? Yes, I, I think many of the people at FOSI already know me from earlier meetings and um, earlier discussions, but uh, the Digital Wellness Lab is a new thing. It is a transformation, a real evolution, if you will, of the Center on Media and Child Health um, at Boston Children's Hospital. Uh, but it's a very contrarian and disruptive idea. And that is that instead of we researchers and academics criticizing the tech industry, criticizing the entertainment industry for the things that they are doing wrong for, for children, um, we are realizing, and we have realized for a long time, that we are getting nowhere by staying in our silos and arguing with each other. And we all have skill sets to bring to bear on this digital environment in which we are all living, in which we are raising children, and we have a responsibility for. And so we will do a whole lot better if we put aside the arguments and find common ground and build a better internet, a build a better space for our children, 
for ourselves and for our society. Wow, okay. So you believe that technology can play a positive role in child development? Absolutely. Well, as, as some of you know, I spent my wicked youth in the film industry as a filmmaker and scriptwriter, um, and um, I've always believed that media are very powerful tools for uh, changing the world, for understanding how we live, who we are, how we should behave. Um, and as with any power tool, this goes either way, depending on how you use it, depending on the level of respect for oneself and others that you bring to it, the level of responsibility you bring to it, and the, frankly, the um, amount of mindfulness you bring to it, which is how are we using these powerful tools to what end? And can we always be aware of the unintended consequences and be constantly correcting ourselves. We will never get this perfect. We will always be a work in progress. But if we can get together, instead of shouting at each other and criticizing each other, if we can get together and say, we recognize that there are problems and there are very, very good things that can happen. I mean, Sesame Street recently celebrated its 50th anniversary mm -hmm. um, as an evidence-based, research-driven, educational screen media program for children. Um, and there are many more beside it, but we need to get this all on a common playing ground and look at it through the same lens and be working toward the wellness of individuals and society. Okay, so the lab recently released a couple of interesting full survey results. Uh, what did you find that stood out? Was it surprising, interesting, what, what came out of that report? Well, I think there were things that were not surprising. Um, children's screen time went up dramatically. Um, and interestingly, um, arguments with parents went up dramatically. So when we dug a little deeper and we asked the parents how the kids were learning in terms of their math, their science, uh, and, and their social emotional learning, um, we found that they were very happy on, uh, the majority of them were very happy with how well they were learning with remote learning. Um, and when you compare it to not learning at all, it's a dramatic improvement, um, but that the social emotional learning slowed down a little bit. And one of the mm -hmm. things that was very interesting about it is that these kids um, on their own moved into what at school would have been the playground, would have been the lunchroom, would have been the place where they're doing their social emotional learning. And they moved into massively multi-user online role-playing games and places. And when I, as a physician, would talk to my patients about what are you doing on these games, they didn't talk about the game. They talked about it as hanging out with their friends. A little bit like us kids when we went to the playground. It wasn't the playground, it was the kids who were at the playground. Absolutely. Um, let me turn to you, Karen. Um, so with kids and families learning to adjust to this new normal of working from home and distance learning during the past year, how has Amazon been supporting them, supporting families? Um, well, Stephen, yeah, it just, it continues to be a really challenging time for families. And, you know, I love Dr. Rich's uh, reference to uh, these products as these devices as tools. And what we've been up to is we've been busy building new tools that can help kids learn, read, play, discover and be entertained from home. Um, let me just give you some examples. We uh, introduced the brand new Fire tablet for older kids. We're giving them more computing power, more capability online. And that includes access to a greater variety of content, you know, depending upon the preference of the parent. But they have needs to use that for schoolwork, which uh, requires a little greater access to different content. And if you remember uh, reading Psychic, we talked about that at last year's FOSI conference. Uh, it's a new way for kids to improve their reading skills by reading along with Alexa. We fully launched that this past year. And on top of all that, we added lots of educational content to our Kids Plus subscription to help kids learn from home. But you know, to really kick off this chat, I wanna focus on one product in particular that we just launched in September and that's called Amazon Glow. 
to give you some background about this product, we spent a lot of time talking with families to see how they're communicating, how they're having fun, how they're connecting. And one area that really caught our attention was around the positive benefits of kids having strong bonds with loving family members and friends. You know, but with family members living so far apart these days, uh, we started thinking about ways that we could help families feel more connected. And GLOW helps kids stay connected with family members and friends, you know, even if they're all the way across the country. GLOW connects kids with their remote loved ones on a video call and enables them to participate in activities together. During a video call on GLOW, kids can see a remote loved one on a dedicated display. And at the same time, they can play games, they can create art, do puzzles, play with tangrams, read together. The child uses the GLOW product and the remote family member or friend engages in the same experience at the same time on a tablet or mobile device using the GLOW app. It's a little bit hard to explain, um, so I have a video that will show you how it works. Hi, Grandpa. Hi, Scout. Are we going to play this puzzle together? Yeah, the pieces are coming in. I want to give you a challenge on your first try. <laughs> can you find some cool stuff on this page? I can see a snail. I can see oh. an owl. I'm drawing the sky. <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> you made the whole thing explode. Oh, just tap it? No, you have to do like this. So watch me now. Okay. Flip it, flip it up. Flip the triangle up. First. Stay. Stay. Uh-huh. Up. School. Good job. Did you see what I did? Look at it. Oh, that's where it goes. Then what goes like this? Oh, oh wait. Huh? What, 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 what? Chicken. Good work, good work. And I will put the last one in. There we go. Can you do it? Yep. Oh, um, uh-huh. What's that one? Tomorrow. Tomorrow. I'll see you tomorrow. I love you. Bye. Well, you know, when I first heard about this product, I really couldn't figure it out. It just didn't seem to fit into one particular category. And seeing this video again just makes me feel like, wow, what, what is this? Um, it is a remarkable interactive tool, particularly across generations, um, never mind across great distances. So I, I'm really excited by this. Uh, Dr. Rich, what did you think of it? I think it, it's a wonderful um, continuation of a lot of what we learned during the year of remote schooling. One of the things that I think in particular is wonderful about it is that the child is not looking at her or himself. Um, one of the things that I would recommend to uh, kids when they were in remote schooling is to turn off the self view and really focus on the other. So it becomes a better analog to really interacting with another human being. Um, it does, you doesn't get that selfie phenomenon going on. Mm -hmm. Like, how do I look? And is my hair straight? And um, should I mug at the camera and things of that nature? Um, but it really removes as much as possible that distance of I'm transmitting something and receiving something because you're not conscious of what you're doing. Um, I think that it really helps um, move toward um, what everyone is saying we are moving toward, which is a, an immersive experience um, in the metaverse. The, the, the digital metaverse, that we're going to be really interacting with each other in real time and in real space, if you will, virtual space. Um, and I think that what this does is instead of using avatars, uses the genuine person, the grandma that you know so well, or the mom who's deployed somewhere in the world. Well, I also love the fact that it takes you and takes the child from the digital world to the physical world right in front of him or her and then back again. I, I just right. I just love that transition. And you just used that word immersive. Um, I can definitely see that. And that alone would keep a three or four year old happy for quite a while. Karen, any, anything else you want to mention about this uh, about this new device? Well, let me just say a couple of things. I thought it was 
it was it's it's a it's an interesting coincidence the release with also with quarantine and the pandemic because we actually did start thinking and, and, and envisioning this product long before the pandemic. But it's just the idea of, you know, um, more a more connected remote experience with a loved one. And certainly the pandemic and so much use of, you know, video conferencing, um, I think has accelerated, um, you know, the use of a tool like this. But in addition to that, with th this device, uh, kids can just have, hundreds of hours of play alone or with a grandparent or other adult um, because they have access to lots and lots of content. We have books, visual art packs, games, tangrams, immersive stories. Um, mm -hmm. It does come with a year of the Kids Plus subscription. And there's also content that was designed just for this medium by you know, partners like Disney Mattel, Nickelodeon, Sesame Workshop. So there's a lot there for a child, you know, to dig in and, and have some fun with. Yeah, and, and Karen, you brought up something really important that I have observed and has been reflected in our surveys. And that is that many of the trends that we became very conscious of during the pandemic were already well in motion before the pandemic. And it really served as an accelerant and an amplifier in both positive and negative ways. Um, the, the, the concerns we had were greater, but also the discoveries we could make were greater. I think one of the wonderful things that GLOW is moving toward is, and with all due respect, disappearing the device, making the device become just a, a window or a space in which, you know, so that we are less conscious of a screen, we are less conscious of a, um, a, a device sort of interceding or, or connecting us. Um, and we are more about how do we, as, you know, humans interact with each other. And, you know, I, I, I don't want to call attention away from your product, but I think one of the best things it does is call attention away from it. <laughs> Excellent. Well, listen, I want to shift gears a little bit. And Karen, um, you know, I'll play devil's advocate for a moment. Um, you know, we're having discussions here at the conference about COPPA, children's privacy, and so on. And I'm sure that there'll be plenty of parents who will wonder about their own kids' privacy with this new device. Talk to us about your approach to privacy in building this new device. How does Amazon even bake that issue in to its new products? Mm. Well, you're absolutely right about that, Stephen. Um, for many years, I, I was a privacy attorney uh, at Amazon. And so I know how important privacy is to our customers, particularly with a device that a child uses. And as with all of our devices and services, with the Glow, privacy is foundational and we build it in by design. You know, the content, all of the games, art packs, videos, uh, they're all from sources that have been curated by kids in the GLOW team. So we have a walled garden of this interesting, entertaining, uh, interactive content. Um, in addition, kids can only call contacts that the grownups in their lives have pre-selected. So it's not like it's not like a device where the kid has the kid is the child is able to enter a contact and reach out themselves. It has to be approved by a parent. And this is similar to our, you know, echo devices where we have a microphone, a physical button on top to disable the microphone. The glow has that same feature where uh, there's a visible privacy shutter that you can turn off and that will disable the camera and the microphone. So if a grown up doesn't want the child to be using the device, doesn't want them to reach out and turn off that shutter. Um, we also give lots of vis visibility to um, grown ups because they can use the parent dashboard to see any recent communications or any communications that their child has had using the device. So tell us how else you've supported kids and families this year, this extraordinary year we've just been through. You know, with kids spending so much time online, you know, doing their homework, distance learning, communication, playing games, you know, we launched our kids' Fire Tablet, Fire Tablet Kids Pro. 
And like I said, this is has more computing power. It's a full featured tablet that's designed for six to 12 year olds. Um, and parents can kind of pick and choose what features they want to enable for their kids. You know, what we like to say is that we, you know, serve kids from preschool to preteen. And this is a device that's that's been made with the preteen in mind. Uh, there's a filtered web browsing experience, and that's different from the old curated web experience that we offered. So the child has more flexibility and ability to access different websites that they might need for their studies or that they might be interested in. Um, and parents have the ability to enable that or not. And if they enable it, they can also block certain websites that they might not want their child to visit. We also have a store feature now that we didn't have before where kids can browse the selection of popular apps and games and then make requests to their parents, you know, to be able to download them. Um, and it has a really slick um, automatic uh, approval tool where the parents will get a message, go to the parent dashboard and decide whether they want to enable that download or not. Um, so those are just some of the features that and, and products that we launched this year to help support that six to 12 year old um, age range. Brilliant, thank you. Um, okay, Dr. Rich, um, changing course again, you have talked um, previously that parents shouldn't focus so much on screen time in and of itself that really they should look at the quality of that screen time. What, what do you mean by that? I think that screen time, as it was conceived in the days when we were concerned about television and how much time children mm -hmm. were watching television, um, I think that we now live in a world where there are screens in virtually every environment we're in. Um, we have them in our pockets. We have them on our wrists. Um, I study this issue, and I couldn't possibly tell you how much screen time I had yesterday or today, for that matter. The flip side of this is that you know, we're, we're surrounded by screens and we need to use these screens as we've also learned in a most poignant way in this past year, that we need to be able to be effective users of these power tools. So instead of worrying about screen time, which made everyone crazy during the year of remote learning because, you know, the kid wasn't even a third of the way through their school day and they'd used up the American Academy of Pediatrics limits already. Um, so I think we should step back from screen time and think about the quality of what we're doing and the intentionality with which we're doing it and the context in which we are doing it. So something that might be very good as in a video chat with a friend is not so good during dinner time or in the middle of the night or in the middle of a class. Mm -hmm. So I think that we need to shift from time to context. And the real issue finally with time is not to limit screen time as if it were something toxic, but to actually allot ourselves non-screen time. Because where the screen time comes in is what it's displacing, what we are not doing because we're on a screen. And this is really to address that kind of default behavior. I don't know what else to do, so I'm gonna look at a smartphone or a tablet or something like that, instead of I'm gonna go outside and, and play in the yard or you know, find a friend and kick a soccer ball around. So I think that we need to be more conscious of the flip side, which is all those other things that screen time may crowd out if we use it as a default behavior. Interesting. Okay, so related to, to screen time, um, I got this question uh, recently from a parent. Um, is all reading the same? In other words, does it matter whether my kid reads on an e-reader versus a book or listens to a story? Uh, does it matter if they skip around between the formats? Let's think about what the fundamentals of reading are. Um, what we are concerned about as children learn to read is their language development, their ability to translate experience into the spoken word and to translate uh, images on a page or on a screen into a whole world in their head. You know, those, those words, how do, we, how do I understand what that is? So in terms of the basic act of reading, of looking at words printed on a page or a screen and imagining that world, 
we are doing essentially the same thing. Um, where it gets a little dicier is when that e-reader or device is designed to do the imagination for the child, is designed to give them little hot links to images of things that otherwise might be created in their head. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that what we have to be very careful about is how we design the content for e-readers rather than say e-readers are better or worse. What I'm really concerned about is how does the child move into the world of language as a synthesis of their life experience that they share with others and that they learn from others with and they pass back and forth both in a verbal setting and in the in the reading setting and writing for that matter. Okay. Um, Karen, we touched on this a little bit when we had the privacy conversation, but talk to us about Amazon Kids' approach to product development. First, uh, in our kids' team, we want parents to have choices, choices about their content their kids see, the features they can access. And so we will offer a variety of choices and controls on our parent dashboard. And we work really hard to be transparent to explain what those controls can do. And that way, you know, grownups can customize each child's experience according to their parenting style and the child's development. And I think that that's a really important uh, point because, you know, different parents just have different views about this. I know that when my 22 year old was 12, he, um, he, spent a lot of time with his devices and I was nervous because of all those recommendations and he was getting a little more screen time than his friends, but he was very interested in, um, it, it was in an interactive way where he's interested in how it worked. And so I let him have, you know, that screen time despite, you know, recommendations to the contrary. So I think that choice is essential to, in, in how we design our products. We're also super thoughtful about content appropriateness and safety for kids. All of the content in our Kids Plus subscriptions curated by a team of experts. And that includes thinking a lot about the diversity of the content because we want all kids to be able to see themselves uh, and to learn about others when interacting with content in our subscription. And finally, uh, we focus a lot on trust by design, which we talked about with the, the Amazon Glow. Uh, we build that security in the products through buttons and switches, controls, transparency, and access. So these are just some of the pillars that we use as we um, develop products. Perfect. I think one of the key things you just said, Karen, which is really important, was you took your 22-year-old back to age 12. And what it made me, you know, reflect on, and is something that we're really conscious of at the Digital Wellness Lab, is that we as a society, as parents and as individuals, are dealing with three moving targets here. The first moving target is the developing child, from infant to child to adolescent to adult. We know a fair amount about that. We've been studying that for a, a century, at least by now. Um, but we're also now dealing with a rapidly evolving digital environment, which is affecting that development in positive and negative ways and reflecting that development as these kids are now not just consumers of screen media, but creators of screen media all the time. And the third moving target is the transformation in all of our behavior because we have these devices in our pockets, on our wrists, perhaps some days in haptic, someday in haptic tattoos. Um, we are moving into a more and more immersive environment. Um, and, and we need to constantly be aware of that. And one of the things that I have really uh, enjoyed about the back and forth we have had with Amazon and with other tech companies is that instead of hearing our concerns as criticisms and as you know an attack, um, the companies are realizing that our goal is similar to the company's goal, which is how do we learn to live with these powerful tools in ways that help our physical, mental, and social health 
and in fact enhance our humanity as opposed to harming it or inadvertently you know, misdirecting us. Really, really well put. And um, I'm gonna have to jump in here because that's all the time that we have uh, for this section. Uh, Karen, thank you very, very much uh, for explaining and uh, describing and showing so much of what you've done this year. Dr. Rich, always a pleasure. I always learn something whenever I'm with you, so I appreciate that very much. Um, and uh, just a, a little plug, um, Amazon is going to be giving away products at its own virtual booth. Uh, so head over there uh, right now because there's going to be a break and uh, we'll see you all again shortly. Thank you both very much. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen.